Welcome this morning, and let's go straight into uh, confession before the message uh, as we bring the word this morning. All right, a confession before the message. One, two, go. As I sit to listen to the word of God today, a door of utterance has been opened unto me, and I hear the voice of God clearly speaking to me. This is the way to go, walk ye in it. I listen under the influence of the Spirit of God, and I'm not distracted by anything or anyone. The Word of God is food to my spirit. I am strengthened by it this morning. It is wine to my heart, creating joy within me. It is oil to my face, causing my life to shine, giving me victory in everything that I do. As my eyes make contact with the scriptures used in this message, the Spirit of God opens new things to me. He also brings to my remembrance things Jesus once showed me. I come to understand God's system on the earth, and I receive instruction, encouragement, correction, and the enabling to live out God's will. Amen. All right, we're still speaking on the subject of understanding the word of faith, and we want to get into something, and this is probably one of the most important aspects of your faith work. I'll say two things if I get into it. Number one, F.F. Botswood said that throughout the whole of human history that God has accepted thanksgiving and praise as the corresponding action to any promise that he gives to humanity. Thanksgiving and praise has been accepted as the corresponding action to it. And then recently at Bishop Oedipo's 70th birthday, uh, Bishop Abioye, uh, David Abioye came to speak at one point, and he said, it was during one, not during the main service, and he said that um, one of the major secrets of this man in this 70 years to his exploit has been the mystery of praise. So today I want to look at that praise dimension when it comes to walking in faith. Nothing is more important in the process of manifestation. Let's start with Matthew chapter 13 and verse 23. But he that received the seed into the good ground is he that heareth the word. The Bible says, and understandeth it. And understandeth it. He understood the word. And it brought forth some 100, some 60, and some 30. Now, in one other place it says, and they understood it not, and Satan came. Now look at this. When one heareth the word of the kingdom, and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, and catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. And this is he that received it by the wayside. So the word was sown into his heart, but he understood it not. And the one who brought forth a hundred sixty thirty fold was one who understood the word. So I want to look at the nature there of the Logos, because if one doesn't really understand the word and its process, any blessing can be stolen by Satan if you don't understand this principle. What I want to share. A blessing that God gives can be stolen by Satan. A process that God starts in one's life towards the manifestation of what he has given can be aborted or truncated if one doesn't understand this. In other words, Jesus is the author and perfecter. The process of perfecting can be truncated where God doesn't get the right cooperation. God will always bring to pass anything that he has said if he gets the right cooperation from the individual that has heard it. 
or that individual creates the right conditions within their lives for God to move. Man needs certain conditions around him for him to live. There must be air. If you take away oxygen, he ceases there. You take a fish out of water, the fish begins to struggle. The environment, the condition must be right. If you take the plant out of the ground, it dies. There is a condition that must be created in the life of a person having heard what God has to say for there to be a move of the Spirit. Now, let me start from John chapter 20, verse 24 to verse 29. Here is something that Thomas, the disciple or apostle, said. Now, Jesus had appeared unto them, or the disciples after his resurrection. And Thomas wasn't there, but he was told about it. So he says here in verse 24, But Thomas, one of the twelve, called Didymus, was not with them when Jesus came. And the other disciples therefore said unto him, We have seen the Lord. But he said unto them, Except I see, I shall see in his hands the print of the nails. He wasn't just who said, I will see Jesus. The print of the nails. And put my finger into the print of the nails. And then he said, Thrust my hand into his side. Not that I just say a wound. I must check into his side. He said, I will not believe. I mean. Jesus was a patient leader. For you to have had that kind of individual on your team that is saying, it's not even for Jesus to appear. I must put my hand, all right, through his side. Then, if not, I will not, which means as an act of my will, I shut out faith or accepting it as a real event out of my life. Now, the next verse tells us, Jesus therefore showed up after eight days, Again, his disciples were within, and Thomas was with them. Then Jesus, then came Jesus, the doors being shut. And I think that's what shocked them out, that he said, this must be Jesus. Everywhere was closed, and Jesus just walked in. And stood in their midst, and said, peace be unto you. And he saith unto Thomas, reach hither thy finger, behold my hands. Reach hither thy hand, and thrust into my side. And be not faithless, but believing. And then Thomas answered and said, my God and my Lord. In other words, he bowed down in worship and said, my God and my Lord. And then Jesus answered, and this is what I want to teach you. And said unto him, Thomas, because thou hast seen me, because thou hast seen me, because thou hast seen me, Thou hast believed. Blessed are those that have not seen, yet have believed. In other words, all the blessings of God are for those who, though they haven't seen, the scripture says, yet they believed. So, no blessings for the person who is waiting for a physical manifestation before he accepts the reality of something, all of the blessings are reserved. That's where the blessing is gotten. Not after, all right, the manifestation. The blessing, which means the blessing means, or blessed means empowered to prosper. That's where the power of God is released to cause advancement in the life of that person. And all of that advancement occurs while the person has not seen anything, yet that individual has believed. What does it mean to believe in this case? Look at Psalm 106 and verse 11. Because he said, Lord, I worship you. The Bible says the waters covered their enemies and there was none left. This was in the Red Sea. And when this happened, the Bible says after it happened, then believed they his words and they sang his praise. Now, 
Thomas only worshipped after he saw Jesus. Jesus said, blessed are those. That's where the blessing is. That believe even though they don't see. Now, this believing is demonstrated. We've seen it in Psalm 106 here. And verse 11, or verse 12. Believed they his words, sang they his praises. In other words, the people that are singing the praises of God. And thanking God and singing his praises are the people that believe even though they have not seen. They are praising God for that particular thing. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 8. And you understand it now. All right, in a new light. He says, whom have not seen you love. In whom though now you see him not. Yet believing, how do you express it? You rejoice with joy, unspeakable, full of glory. That blessed are those who even though they see not, haven't seen it. They are praising and they are rejoicing with joy, unspeakable, full of glory. Then the next verse is receiving the end of your faith. In other words, you move from believing to receiving as you begin to express that belief there in praise and rejoicing right unto God. So the blessings are reserved for those that understand the place there of praising and thanking God. And that's why in Isaiah 49 and verse 13, God came to them and said, sing. All right, oh heavens, because that's how you start. That's how the blessing, that's how the changes begin. That's how things begin to get visible. That's how the power of God starts getting visible in the life of a person. It says, sing, all right, oh heavens, and be joyful, O earth. Break forth, that's where the breakthrough comes. When you break forth into singing, O mountains, for the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. We're going to come back to scripture. But what did Zion say? They said, we can't sing because we've seen nothing. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken, which means I can't praise. Why can I not praise, all right? Because the Lord seems to have forsaken me. Now, the reason why it seems like the Lord has forsaken is because there is no sound of joy that is coming out, rejoicing and praise. Now, but the person is saying, well, you know, look at the condition of my life. How am I going to sing praises unto God? And that's what's happening, that people are allowing the condition on the outside. And this is how Satan will see this, steals the word of God here from people. Because if you're going to judge God's presence in your life, by what is going on on the outside, then there is absolutely going to be no way you are going to be in sync or in fellowship with him. Because what he says next in Isaiah 49 verse 14 is simply this. He said, or oh Zion said, verse 15, he said, can a woman forget her sucking child that she should not have compassion upon the son of her womb? Yea, they may forget, but I will not forget thee. He says, behold, I've graven thee upon the palms of my hands. It's almost like where they pierced me. That's where you are. Every time I look at it, I see you. And thy walls are continually before me. Uh, so but God says, I cannot. Therefore, for you to be in a situation or in a circumstance and say that, look, you know, and, and to complain, mom, and say that if, if, if God was there, look, God is there. The issue is people have not created the conditions where God will be made visible in their lives. And the conditions have to be created before you have the manifestation on the outside. Because God has already blessed you, we've seen this, and he's already with you. 
and you never question whether God is there or not. In Exodus chapter 17, verse 7, that's how they question God. They said, is the Lord among us or not? It's a question you can't ask. All right, we can't question his Lord. They said, and he called his name Massa and Merimba because of the chiding of children of Israel and because they tempted the Lord, saying, is the Lord among us or not? And these were the folks who had just finished praising God, right, and singing and rejoicing because they saw the Red Sea part. And they were singing praises after the manifestation. Then the next thing that happened was that they got to Mara. And they began to complain because the waters were bitter. And the same people that saw God manifest himself in parting the Red Sea forgot about everything at that particular point and began to murmur and to complain. And, you know, the Bible says, whoever cometh to God must believe that he is. Is means presented. He is your ever-present help. All right? In a time of trouble, ever. You must believe that he is. Not that he was or he's going to. He is. That he's right there with you. And that he begins to become visible in the life of a person. We'll see this here. When you begin to praise and you as an individual begin, all right, to thank him. So blessed are those that believe yet have unseen. And this blessings, therefore, is reserved for those who are walking by faith and not walking by sight. Now, here is the issue that somebody may now ask. Well, if that is the case and I can see nothing, what's the basis upon which I therefore am going to rejoice and give him praise? And there's a basis for it. Because desire is not the basis for faith. Your personal passion is not the basis for faith. All right? That I want something, it doesn't, it's not the basis for faith. That's not the base. There's a, there's a foundation for it that must be understood. It's not the basis of faith. I mean, we are here, we have fans of different clubs here. If you ask all of us, we are all fully persuaded. Where we got our persuasion from is just make-believe that our club is winning it. My friends from us now believe that the nine-point deficit will be taken care of easily. My friends from... Manchester City believe that we have been in this place before. Even our friends from Manchester United believe this new coach they have got is coming to do. And they are persuaded. And we also believe, all right, that um, we're on top of the table, everything is going well. But that's no basis for conviction. All right? None of us have heard from heaven concerning it, but we're just moving with passion. And people can be passionate, they can go to war on their passion. That's why the Bible says you can give your body to be burnt, but you still are not operating on the spiritual. You can give all of your goods to the poor, and still it's not coming from the right place. So what is the basis here of this belief? We see it in Luke chapter 1 and verse 48 or 45. How then did they enter there? You enter into it by hearing God. All right? That's why people that didn't understand. Now, I want to say something here. When he says they didn't understand the word, when the word comes on the inside of you and God gives you his word, this is what you need to understand. Nothing changes on the outside. When God speaks to a person and a person hears God, this is what you must understand. If you don't understand it, Satan will steal it. Nothing changes on the outside. Look, if you lay hands on a person to get filled with the Holy Spirit, God enters into that person, and that person can, and that is the most powerful gift after accepting Jesus that anybody will ever get. There cannot be anything that is superior to the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Yet that individual can stand there, receive the Spirit of God in a moment. Clothes don't change. Nothing on the outside change, changes, but the Holy Ghost has entered into the person. If you don't know that and you are judging the entrance of God into a man by external things, then that experience can be taken away from you is what they're saying here. If we go to Acts chapter 7, 27, you will see that Paul, when he prayed, it's after long abstinence, the Bible says, Paul came down and says, be of good cheer, it shall be unto me as the Lord has spoken unto me. 
And he told them, all right, be of good cheer. I believe it shall be even as it was told me. Verse 26, it goes on and says this. How be it must be cast on a certain island. Now, if you go to from verse 22, now we'll get to this, but let's go to verse 22 here. He says, now I exhort you be of good cheer, for there shall be no loss of any man's life among you but of the sheep. Look at what he says. Next verse. He says, For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, whom I serve. That's Jesus. It's not, it's not, a, it's not an angel he's talking about. He's talking about Jesus. Because whom, whose I am is not an angel. All right? And whom I serve. Jesus. He says, verse 24. He says, Saying, Fear not, Paul, for thou must be brought before Caesar. And lo, God had given thee all them that sailed with thee. Verse 25. Wherefore, sirs, he said, Be of good cheer, for I believe God. I believe God. That's why it says rejoice, be of good cheer. I believe God, it shall be even as it was told me. Now Jesus came and told him. In open manifestation of Jesus, look at the condition whether it changed. Verse 26, how be it we must cast on a certain island? Verse 27, but when the 14th night was come and we were driven up and down in Adria about midnight, the ship, they were still driven up at night and they drew near to some country, verse 28, and I sounded and found 24, which means, look, they were still going, nothing changed on the outside. Now that word could have been stolen from them. When somebody says, if Jesus came to meet you and spoke to you last night, this morning, everything should have changed. Now, how does he steal that word? Because people say that they hear God. I'm going to show this here. They hear God, but they look on the outside. Now, Kenneth Hagin said this, and this is the important thing I want to say. He said, look, he said, when he was in the voice of healing movement, and he, he said, look, I say this with all, with all gravity. He says, understand my heart. He says, you'll be seeing healings happening with ease. People were bent backwards, straightened up. He says, understand my heart. He said, sometimes I regret I was part of that movement. I said, why? He said, because people were losing their healing. In fact, it almost brought the church back then, in some cases, into a worse state. Because if Satan leaves a place, he is coming back with seven more powerful spirits. If the people don't know how to hold their ground and, and keep that place occupied. So he said, what will happen? A person will get healed. And how? Because they're operating uh, by the gifts of spirit, he will get healed by knowing that physically something has changed. Then what happens? He leaves that place and he's telling everybody has testified in church, I'm healed, I'm healed, I'm healed. And they can't say the person is physically healed. Goes home, after five days, he just feels something in his body again, a sharp pain in that area, and opens his mouth and says, oh, it is back. Oh, it is back. Come and pray for me. Guys, come and pray for me. It looks like this thing is coming back. Listen, by saying that, he opens the door because he doesn't understand how the word operates. Opens the door and the enemy comes back in. And they lose the healing. Now, if they understood it, once it comes there, right there, they go back to God and say, Father, I thank you because I'm perfectly healed from the crown of my head to the soles of my feet. And they fight that good fight of faith, standing on that, and the enemy doesn't have a point to come back into them. But once they open their mouth and say, please come and pray for me, it looks like this thing is back on me and all of that, then they run into trouble. So it says here, what's the basis? Blessed is she that believe, for there shall be a performance, which means the performance starts after she believed. Blessed is she that believed, there shall be a performance. There was no performance when she believed. Blessed is she that believed. Jesus said, these blessings is for those that believe. For there shall be a performance of those things that were told her by the Lord. What God told her was what God told her. He didn't tell anybody. When God tells you something, he tells you. He's not telling everybody. So, there will be a performance of those things that were told her by the Lord. In other words, what is the basis, therefore, of our belief? Why are we rejoicing? We are rejoicing because we heard what God has to say about that situation. We are not just rejoicing because we feel that if we start praising God, then we'll get God to do our desires. If we start praising God, then God's head will swell. He's on the throne and he'll lose control of himself. And then he'll come down and say, I'm hearing somebody praising. What exactly do you want? Whatever you want. No, that's not what he's saying here. We are not manipulating God with praise. That is, we go to God in prayer first. That's how you're going to hear him. That's why he says in Psalm 28 and verse 1, it says, Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. 
Be not silent unto me, lest if thou be silent unto me, I become like them that go down into the pit. One major reason we keep saying this prayer is communication with God. It's not telling God what you want him to do. It's communication with him. In other words, he says here in Psalm 28 verse 1, he says, God, I have cried unto you concerning my issue. Don't be silent unto me. Speak back. If you are silent, I will be like those that go down into the pit. There will be no difference between me and the person that didn't pray. So the purpose of prayer, therefore, is to hear from heaven. Now, when you hear from heaven, what do you do? Or how do you hear from heaven when you pray? So we look at Psalm 40. It says, I cried unto you, O Lord, my rock, in Psalm 28. I waited patiently for the Lord and inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up out of the horrible pit, out of the mary clay, and set my feet upon a rock. If you compare that to Psalm 28, you know that rock is hearing. Go to Psalm 28, verse 1. That rock is, that rock is setting up. But I heard what you had to say about this. That's a rock. Unto thee will I cry, O Lord, my rock. Be not, not silent unto me. That's the rock should speak to me. Lest if thou be silent, I be like them that go down into the pit. That's the Mary clay. Look at Psalm 40, verse 2. He brought me out of the horrible pit. He says the same thing. Out of the Mary clay. How did he do it? And put him on that rock. That rock is hearing. And set my feet upon a rock to stay. And he says he has established my goings. What is the goings he established? Look at the next verse. He has put a new song. So you can see that singing here. In my mouth, even praise unto God. Many shall see this. That's the transaction. Many shall see it and fear and shall put their trust in the Lord. Look at verse 6. He said, what he showed me was sacrifice offering thou did not desire. Mine ears has thou opened. That's, he heard it. So in prayer, when you are praying about something, it is not difficult. Ask him, Lord, open my ears concerning this thing and my eyes to see what you, is the same thing we've been saying, that you might know those things that are freely given to you of God. What is it that you have given concerning this? Open my eyes and my ears to hear it. And he goes on in verse 7. He shows us where he got it. He says, lo, I come in the volume of the book. It is written of me. It's the same thing he says in Isaiah 20, 29 and verse 18. Exactly the same thing. It says, in that day shall the death. Now go to verse 17. It says this. It's not a little while that Lebanon shall be turned into a fruitful field. That's where the tongue comes. And a fruitful esteem as a forest. How does it happen? In that day shall the deaf hear the words of the book. And the eyes of the blind shall see out of obscurity. Those are the two things you should pray. God, open my ears to hear what is in scripture. And my eyes to see the opportunities that are there. And then look at the response to it. He now says, then shall the meek increase their joy. And the poor men shall rejoice. Which means after they have heard. All right, in the Holy One of Israel. The next verse. And then it goes on. For the terrible one is brought to naught and all of that. Okay? So, you see that victory begins to come when they do that. So, the issue here is prayer there. And you begin to, 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 to rejoice in the word that he has given to you. That's how that word begins to grow. That's what he says in Psalm 67 verse 6. Then shall the earth yield her increase. And God even a God. That means that earth that brings forth, the way it yields its increase. The way you eat the bread of the increase of the earth is from that place of praise. All right? So the blessings there come upon and it's something we've got to understand and learn. Let's look again at Jonah chapter, chapter 2 and verse 7 and verse 8. I want to bring this into something here. It says, when my soul fainted within me, you see the pattern here. I remembered the Lord and my prayer came unto thee into thy holy temple. Now God answers and that means he heard something. Then it says, they that observe lying vanities, which means after God has heard, this is the nature of the word. The word when he enters doesn't change things first. The word enters into you, and then you respond to that word in obedience. He says, they that observe lying vanities forsake their mercy. 
Now, if you go to Isaiah 49, verse 13, let's look at these scriptures here. It says, sing. It says, they that observe lying vanities forsake their mercy. Look at Isaiah 49, 13. Sing, O heavens, be joyful, O earth. Break forth into singing, O mountains. For the Lord has comforted his people and will have mercy. In other words, he says, I have comforted you in Christ. But for this mercy to be made evident in your life, I need you to sing. He says, he will have. He has comforted part, but he will have mercy. Remember, they that observe lying vanities forsake their own mercy, which means the mercy God wants to show, they are the ones that forsake. It's not God that forsake. He says they forsake their own mercy. Now, the next verse, he says, but I will sacrifice with the voice of the... I say they sacrifice because there's no change on the outside. It is something I'm doing because of what I heard in prayer. I will sacrifice with the voice of thanksgiving. I will pay that which I have vowed. Salvation belongs to the Lord. It was after he did that, that the Lord now spoke to the fish and it vomited out Jonah. Now, here is what he's saying. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy, which means you don't forsake mercy. You obtain mercy. And then he says, and find grace to help in a time of need. In other words, you will find God as your ever-present help in a time of need. If you go about it this way. Because pull up that scripture in Psalms and look at what it says. Your ever present help in a time of need. All right. God is a refuge. Look at this. A very present help in trouble. Now look at the next verse. It says, therefore we will not fear. Though the earth be removed. Though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea. Look at what it says. Though the waters thereof roar. Which means there are no changes. Don't let him steal that word with all what he's doing on the outside. Right? And the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Verse 4. There is a river. It says, the streams make of glad, make glad the city of God. The holy places of the tabernacle of Mount Zion. It says, God is in the midst of her and she shall not be moved. God shall help her and right early. All right? Verse 6 tells us, all right, the heathen rage, the kingdoms move. What will bring that manifestation? Go to verse 4 there. It tells us, it says, there is a river, the streams whereof make glad the city of God. It is those streams that come out. When Jesus said, if any man thirst, let him come to me and drink. He said, they said, look, come to the waters. Put up, uh, let me put up Isaiah 55 verse 1. It says, everyone that is thirsty, come to the waters. These are the waters. And ye that hath no money. Now you see how you access it. Come and buy and eat. Come buy wine and milk without money, without price. He says, wherefore do you spend money for that which is not bread? You labor for that which satisfies not. Hekin, hekin, listen. Diligently unto me and eat that which is good and let your soul delight itself in fatness. It's from hearing God there that you get it. And I've told that hearing God is hard. You just must be willing to hear him. In other words, God, it is what you are saying I will hear concerning this particular situation. And what you always say is a glad tidings of great joy. You go up to him in prayer and you open your Bible. You see it there. Nothing has changed on the outside, but the Bible says the light of the eyes causes the heart to rejoice. In Proverbs 15, 30, the light of the eyes will cause the heart to rejoice and a good report shall make the bones fat. In other words, the light of the eyes is what brings about joy. Joy and rejoicing, that's the good report that causes the bones to be made fat. That's the order of God. Now, what Satan wants to do is to steal. And what people like Christians are doing is singing the song of Bob Marley. Okay? All right? You know, Bob Marley sang from scripture. He says, by the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. This is what people are saying. We hung our harps upon the willows by the midst of the sea. For there, they that carried us away captive required of us a song. They that wasted us required of us mirth, saying, Sing unto us one of the songs of Zion. How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? This is what people are saying. He says, How shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? You ain't coming out of captivity without singing the Lord's song. All right? Psalm 81 tells us that. That Joseph, Isaac, 
they understood that you sing the Lord's song. Sing aloud to God as strength. Make a joyful noise to the God of Jacob. Take a sound. Bring hither a timbrel, a pleasant harp in the psaltery. Blow the trumpet in the new moon, the time appointed of a solemn feast day. This he was a statute for Israel and a law of God, the God of Jacob. He says, he ordained in Joseph for a testimony when he went through the land of Egypt. Where I had a language I understood not. He says, I removed his shoulder from his body. They went to hang their harps when that was the time for them to begin to sing. His hands were delivered from the pot when the song came. So he sent his word, all right, and delivered them. So the word comes, and that becomes the basis there of our song there. And then we see that. So we also see this. We've been talking about this, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 13. And we want to connect this, and then I just close here. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off. They were persuaded of them. They embraced them. They confessed they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The next verse says, They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. And if they had been mindful from the country in which they came, they might have had, no opportunity, had an opportunity to have returned. But he says, now they desire a better country, heavenly. Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. In other words, this is what we're saying here. When you are in any situation, God has already prepared something for you. You go to God in prayer to open your ears, your eyes, so that you may see what he has already prepared for you for that situation. Then you start your journey into that particular place. They that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. How do you seek it out now? Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 14, it tells us, for here we have no continuing city, but we seek one to come. The next verse says, by him therefore let us offer the sacrifice of praise unto God continually. That is the fruit of our lips giving thanks unto his name. That's how you move towards the manifestation of something there by that song. So he speaks to you that you may come with a new song. And that's the song of the place where he's taking you to. And as you begin to sing, and understand this, the power of God can be in operation and it can stop. And when does it stop? When the song stops. Listen to what I'm saying here. And it stops because you observed lying vanities. Just as Peter went and was walking on water, he had heard the word of God. Walking on water means doing the impossible. Doing the impossible means you are singing there. In other words, this is what he's saying here. He's saying that if you hear from God that you should go and build something, a house, and you don't have any money, all you have is 15,000 and God told you to go and build. You only have a million and you take a million and buy blocks and you start praising him, right, for that house that is complete. The supply of that thing will come supernaturally. It may come in terms of finance, it may come in terms of people bringing things, but the supply or jobs that you will do, but the supply will continue until one day somebody tells you that we've changed the price of this because of the currency and all of that. It's going to cost you three times more than that. You observe that and you say to yourself, wow, I may not be able to finish this. The power of God that was causing that thing to happen stops. In other words, if they come with it, say, Father, I thank you. And I praise you that we've done this. Thank you for this win because it has come to open up new dimensions to us. We give you all of the praise for this. That's the way you keep moving with God's word. And because the path of the just is as a light that shines brighter and brighter, and it's that light that governs that joy inside your heart, you keep your eyes on the word, you keep yourself in prayer, you keep yourself in the word, you keep praise on your lips, the power of God cannot stop moving in your life. And of course, there's one more thing. I heard my friend Reverend McCankin say this. The cost of moving a mountain is forgiveness. Because Jesus said this. This is the cost of moving a mountain. It's forgiveness. He said, whosoever shall stand before this mountain, be thou removed and cast into the sea, and shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things he's saying shall come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith. Then he says, I say unto you whatsoever things you desire, when you pray, believe that you receive them and shall have them. However, when you stand praying, he said, this is the biggest obstacle, not the mountain. The biggest obstacle is if you have ought in your heart against anything. Forgive. God gave me that message to tell someone because it was not part of what I prepared. 
The bigger mountain is unforgiveness, not the mountain on the outside. If you can get rid of unforgiveness from your heart, you have the capacity to move that mountain on the outside. But don't forget this. You are not using praise to bribe God, to do what you want him to do. Praise is your response to what he has said, regardless of appearances. And once their praise begins to happen, there will be a performance of those praise. Look at, let me close with Romans chapter 4. You will see it here and verse 18. Romans chapter 4 and verse 18. Who against hope believed in hope that may become a father of many nations according to that which was spoken. So it's always according to that which is spoken. So shall thy seed be. The Bible says, and being not weak in faith, considered not his own body now dead and, and 100 years old and deadness of Sarah's womb, he staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith. How? By giving glory to God. And then the scripture says, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able to perform. Luke 145 says, blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance. So we will start seeing a performance when a person begins to give God praise and thanks. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for this word. I ask by the power of your spirit to establish us in this truth, takes deep root on the inside of us and brings forth massive fruit in our lives in Jesus' mighty name. Now, I believe some of you started on projects that were right, you aborted those things because something happened in the condition and you observed it and allowed it to contaminate it. Go back to those things. Pick them up with praise. All right, listen to me. Pick them up now back with praise. You got the word on it. You heard from heaven. All right? You expected that the fact that you heard from heaven meant that immediately things should change. You came against something that was rocky and thorny. And you believed that. That's what literally happened more than what God said to you. Now, the issue is you were, that was the last stop for manifestation. I repeat what I'm saying here. That thing was the, you know who I'm talking to, the last stop for manifestation when you drop the ball. All right? If you only had praised God and thanked him in that dark hour, the light will have done instantly. That was the point of manifestation. For they that observe the clouds, the Bible says that it will not rain. That was the point where the manifestation should have come. And you have a chance to go and pick up that word again and start the process of thanking God and praying and going back to that thing he told you and praying again over it and looking at it in the word of God and then getting that light again and starting that journey. And when the attack comes, rejoice in that day because the manifestation is at your doorstep. And if the attack comes through people, let them go. Are you following what I'm saying here? If you're on your way somewhere and you find a crazy man on the road, you don't stop there. To, you park your car. You let the crazy man walk across. And then you start your car again. And then you go. There's no pride in dealing with the crazy man. There's no ego. You're not trying to prove a point. You're not trying to argue with the crazy man that, listen to me, I'm right, you're wrong. Don't deal with him. He doesn't understand what he is doing. Just let him go. If you meet a drunk person on the road who is doing things, you let the drunk person go. Just treat anybody who behaves crazy around you that way. With respect, park, go, and continue my journey. Without any reference. No, no reference to it, except you are just joking and say, you know, I met somebody that was this. But no, they don't take it personal. They, that you don't do anything. You just go on. That's the way and manner you should go on with your life. All right. Okay, then. Um, um, blah, 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 blah. Our prayers towards Warpex starts um, tomorrow. I'm pleased we're putting out our videos in mass from tomorrow, and we want everybody, every person now is a broadcast um, center. You know, in Egypt, I think in Egypt, after the Arab Spring, if you had 5,000 followers on social media, you had to register as a media organization. That's you, your own self. You're a media organization. And then the law, you are, you are under certain restrictions on law, which means you can't retweet or repost something that is false because it, it, you'll be charged like a media entity. In other words, they've come to realize that even media houses are taking their news off handles from people who are right on the spot. 
uh, because if there's something that happens somewhere, it's the people that are on the spot that record it, that post it there. If it's going to be a big thing, I mean, if they, God forbid, they say there's a fire incident somewhere, the first person you're going to hear from, which wasn't so 20 years ago, is the, is the radio station, I'll get a television station. But now every individual is that. So change your mind, all right? You need to change your mind. It's not the church that is going to do it for you. It's not the billboards that are going to do it. It is the individuals there in their personal, interpersonal relationships that will push it. Nothing is too small. It could be your own post. could just be your own post that will bring one person there that needs to be there. So don't say, well, I only have 25 people. One among those 25 people or that will be reposted will be the very person that God is looking at. All right? So let every one of us begin to post and push it. Don't like it. Share it. Don't like it. Share it. All right? And put your own personal comments there. God bless you all. And then I have another announcement on Sunday next week. So just be uh, psychologically ready for that one. Okay, then. God bless you all.